Hello everyone, this is Dr. Shi Jun Wang. Today's video, I'm going to continue talking about the second part, the development and recap uh, sections of the Beethoven Grand Pathetic Sonata. Um, last video, um, I stopped at measure 133, so that's where I'm going to start today. Um, this is really quite a, a unique uh, sonata, right? Usually we don't see um, a fast movement uh, interrupted by uh, several uh, slow sections. So I guess he, Beethoven was thinking this slow, fast, slow, fast as a whole. So even the, um, the, uh, the uh, development section started with this slow introduction. Um, and however, he did not start as usual, the composers would start the development section on a dominant key. So this is still on G dominant, but the minor dominant. So that kind of tragic feeling remained. Um, and last video, I forgot to stress, uh, address one thing. Um, here in this first chord, we have a kind of peculiar uh, marking, forte, immediately followed by a piano and, and acoustically on this piano it's not able it's not realistic to achieve right how can we play a note a loud chord and then suddenly have a <laughs> the, the volume dropped to the piano level but unless you can maybe probably with a, 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 the computer you can tune the volume down um, and here, um, what is the real uh, intention behind this, right? We know Beethoven's uh, piano, um, forte piano, uh, he has less sustain in the sound. So it's actually easier if you're using the historically made piano, uh, the period instruments. But still, it's not sudden for a sudden uh, piano um, so I think the message behind this is um, a, a, any section with a forte piano uh, there uh, it really means the whole thing is supposed to be piano the atmosphere should be piano the mood should be in piano but then the first chord almost like you couldn't help yourself you couldn't control maybe the rage, the anger, you couldn't control it. So that you play it loudly, but then you regret, you want it to, to be piano. And, and why is that important? Because how you connect the next note is important. And also how you listen to the end of the long note also uh, is different. So after this, you have to think this is really, really soft, less pedal, don't hold the pedal because that will actually hold the sonority longer. So you want the sonority to drop a little quicker. And you have to listen to it until it softens. That, of course, not that long, but... you see a rest, a 16th note rest in the left hand and then an 8th note rest in the right hand. What does it mean? It's it really, it's a quick uh, pick up to the next section, to the next measure. And uh, you're supposed to breathe. With a lot of energy. I think uh, it's almost like you're using this to create more dramatic effect. Um, and of course, this slow section didn't last as long as the beginning. It only has four measures. And towards the end, you see this uh, <laughs> massive amount of uh, syncopation, right? Between the left and right hand, there are uh, 12 notes. Um, and how do you explain syncopation to kids? Um, it's like a seesaw, right? One note and then the other one. And so, so you play after uh, another. 
but really the effect of, of syncopation uh, had nothing to do with, with this <laughs> game. Um, you're supposed to be sustaining each note as long as possible, and you're supposed to create massive amount of tension. So here, uh, suggestion number one, don't lift E early. Right? You're supposed to hold it. And then, strange enough, you see a diminuendo, right? Decrescendo. But I guess the tension has nothing to do with volume. And in many cases, um, the softer it gets, more tension accumulates, right? Sometimes when when the, the kid made a mistake, the parents are mad. They don't just talk to the kids in, in the normal volume. They do it very softly, but it's more scary. Um, so I guess that's um, the case here. It's really a recycle bin of all the materials uh, from the exposition part. So here it's from, and obviously everyone can, can relate. Um, however, uh, there is really um, uh, kind of a tricky spot here. This note, I often hear people, uh, maybe I just <laughs> did and made a mistake, uh, but I often um, think about that part when I play. Why? Because compared to the exposition part, it's basically a straight line up. The direction doesn't change. And you only use um, you only use four and three to start a two-note group. But here, here you start with pinky. And then you have to switch the direction as well. So be a little mindful of, of that. And here we have one measure of loudness and then subito piano. I think that's from and then so this even this emotional treatment is recycled, is, is reused here. And later on here that we have so many two-note slurs in a row for the left hand. Um, and here I have to spend some time talking about two-note slurs. Two-note slurs, I think it's the really the most basic thing we have to teach students uh, in terms of how to phrase. And what does the legato sign, what does this slur really mean? Um, to me, I think the slur is more of a sign um, for volume. It has nothing to do with overlapping, right? Of course, if you studied Chopin, yeah, he, he asked you to even ch change finger on one note so that you can connect. Um, but I think that's really not, I mean, that's of course a great thing to do. That's something we have to follow, but that's not a very basic uh, understanding of, of how do we connect. Um, the, the very basic is the first note has to be deep and then the second note has to be uh, very light. Um, this of, of, of the two notes first. And of course Chopin has much longer phrases, but again, everything derives from the two notes slur of, of Haydn, Mozart, and, and of course Bach. The second note here, not a new strike. It's not a, a new uh, note. It's a byproduct. It's something you make of this note, and then you have maybe a tiny bit of envy left. You're, you're letting go to prepare the next group, and then you play that note. So I used to say, there is no note head. 
Only the second uh, theme group is uh, on a different key. But here I want to add one thing that I forgot to mention um, in the first part, in the first video. And that starts with a, a story my uh, professor at Juilliard told me, uh, Mr. Joseph Kalikstein. Um, and uh, many people in the States and, and, and in Europe um, probably have heard of the name. He is a great musician, um, a, a very good chamber music player. Um, he has this, I think last time they celebrated his 40 years, so maybe now is maybe almost 50 years. I hope they still play together uh, for, for half a century, um, the uh, Kalikstein Laredo Robinson Piano Trio. And he's a longtime jury for the Van Cliburn competition. And, Probably he's been there for the past 20 or 30 years um, judging the competition, maybe maybe um, five or six editions. And one uh, fall semester, right, the previous summer, um, there was this <laughs> competition. Um, I, I forgot which one. Um, and he mentioned to me um, that three of the contestants played the Beethoven Sonata 110. And he said, out of the three of them, two, Play this section. He said three out of four, two out of three played it like this. Right? They kind of played the last one longer instead of everything kind of separated. And we're talking about like Van Cliburn competition, right? Everyone selected is already a, a great professional, uh, probably has big careers, uh, uh, like a mature pianist. So I guess we have to really fight with our instinct, right? Our hands wants to be lazy, to take a break there, but we can't let them. It's much harder to play all the way uh, separated. And here too, 
um, after he told me that story and I, I can reevaluate everything I play, of course I did this. Right? It's because it's easier. It, it, it probably it use, I use less energy, but that's not the way. So I have to really keep that last one separated as the previous two. Okay, and this thing really remains the same until the end. Um, measure 229, um, <laughs> this, uh, right? Many, many composers really has a habit of doing this, kind of like a make it a, a, a cycling thing, right? The ending is the beginning. The beginning is also the end. Um, kind of make it a circle. Um, and here, just one thing uh, that happens to many of my students, they tend to over pedal the last five chords. They think um, the more pedal they use, then the more uh, kind of majestic feeling they can create. Um, I don't think that's the case here. Because what pedal do is, um, of course, it keeps more sonority, reaching, it gives you rich uh, sonority. But uh, on one hand, it also softens the atmosphere. It softens the chord. It makes everything big and then it decays, right? You can't control when to cut it. So here, I think Beethoven was trying to, he, there are two fortissimos, right? He added another one uh, on the, the third to the last measure. So he really wanted this movement to end majestically. So if we have long pedal, then the pedal will eventually decay. Right then we finish it in a kind of like a downward motion. But no, we have to have very short pedal and then we play together with the pedal together with the note, we release the pedal together with the hand. So, okay. Um, and one last point. Um, this is not the last note of the piece. There is another whole extra measure of rest with a fermata there. And how do we play that measure? How do we play that measure? We have to freeze. We have to be still in that atmosphere. We can't just start scratching and probably uh, um, do the, make sure the, the clothes are, are uh, feeling comfortable in concerts. Uh, no, we have to. Still in that mood and then relax. Um, I often joke with my students that they don't respect rests enough. Um, rest, it's really a terrible uh, translation, I guess, uh, because when we talk about rest, it's like resting area, right? You can take a break. But really, rest is really, it's music without sound. And, and music without sound, silence can really mean so much, right? So here, you, you, you end in this kind of majestic feeling. And, and and I mentioned before, there was this one rest, it really means like a, a very heroic pickup. So uh, for, for students, please closely exam, uh, examine all the rests and know the purpose. And of course, we have to follow them like you, you follow the law. Um, uh, you have to really do everything accurately from the beginning and accurately to the end. I hope you liked the video. I hope this helps um, many students when they start learning or keep learning this great work. And if you like my videos, please subscribe my channel because I will uh, update weekly. I will upload a new tutorial video each week. So next week I will start the second movement, this beautiful cantabile a singing um, second slow movement. Thank you so much for watching. I will see everyone 